Barbing barbu. When two cases of very public, very mysterious deaths are linked together, and they happen in the span of like a week, two people pass in a week under mysterious circumstances, the public is bound to have questions. So in June of 2020, a young 28-year-old woman by the name of Disha Salion allegedly dropped off the 14th floor of an apartment building in India. According to some sources, Disha was having a fun night with her friends. She was partying. And according to her friends, she also had quite a bit to drink. While at this party, she decides, you know what? I'm going to go into one of the rooms that has a restroom and kind of lock the door. Her friends went in to see if she was okay. And the door is locked. They're knocking on it. They hear running tap water from a sink. And they assume maybe she's throwing up. Maybe she's been drinking a lot and doesn't want us to hear all of that. They decide to give her some space, but when they go back to check up on her, the water is still running at a constant flow. Something about it just didn't feel right. They start panicking, they break down the door, they quickly scan the room and the restroom, it's empty, and allegedly, they heard a group of partygoers starting to scream. They lean over the 14th floor balcony, and 14 floors down, looking back at them, was Disha's body on the ground. She was rushed to the hospital and declared dead. Now, two theories were presented initially about her death. Either she willingly went over the edge because she she was unhappy with everything that was going on in her life, or she was so intoxicated she lost her balance and slipped over the edge. But the thing is, a lot of people didn't believe either of these theories. And at one point, the Mumbai police claimed that the files of Disha's death were deleted, quote, accidentally, and this only fueled the theories even more. And on top of that, a very outspoken politician came forward to say, hey, everyone, get it together. The police are covering up the truth of what happened to Disha. He claimed that Disha was killed and even the state minister was involved in her cover-up. So you're like, okay, who's Disha? Why would the state minister be involved? Disha was a manager for talented stars in Bollywood. She was frequently rubbing shoulders with Bollywood elites and what some might call the Bollywood mafia. There was a rumor, again, this is a rumor, that she was essayed by powerful Bollywood figures or even multiple figures and then thrown off the 14th floor balcony. But before she was allegedly killed, she made one last phone call to an actor that she used to manage, a beloved actor whom she might have trusted to be able to help her. Just six days later, that same actor, one of the biggest stars in Bollywood, died mysteriously. Police stated that in his computer search history, he was looking up details of Disha's mysterious death. And then six days later, he passed. So was this all a coincidence? Was there something darker going on? Because the police are ruling Disha's death an accident and they're ruling this actor's death as self-inflicted. This is the story of Sushant Singh Rajput, an incredibly talented, intelligent individual in India whose death just has left so many unanswered questions. As always, full show notes are available at RottenMinglePodcast.com, but I have a very long list of disclaimers to get through today. This case, I'm just going to be fully transparent with you. This case feels like an onion to me. That is the only way that I can describe it. So the first layer of the onion, we have like what we think are the facts of this case, but even that feels so wishy-washy. There just aren't enough credible sources out there on what truly happened. Facts have been twisted, debated, manipulated. I mean, some have been proven false. Nothing is what it seems in this case. It has just been so frustrating because, I mean, the question that kept coming up is, what do we even know? So as we peel back each layer of the onion, there are unverified theories that start coming out. And even those, like each single layer that we're getting into gets darker and more sinister. And as we dive deeper, I honestly felt like I was kind of losing a sense of like, wait, what are the facts again? Like it was a lot. 
it is a case where I think the second that I thought I knew what was going on, I was like, I have, I would read something else. I would see something else. I'd be like, I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to try and be as unbiased as possible. We had literally every single Indian researcher that we work with on this case. And I think we had a lot more confidence going into this case than we do after the case. It's like that confusing. It's so open-ended. So we're going to do our best to state facts as facts and rumors as rumors and represent all sides of the case. But please, please, please let us know if we unintentionally misrepresent information or something gets lost in translation. I mean, there's also so many different theories, so many different debated parts on this case. If I didn't mention it, most likely I didn't know how to fit it in because this video can't be 10 hours long. Please leave it in the comments. And also... I was not familiar with Sushant's work prior to this case. I've been getting so many comments to cover his case, which is why I started diving into his career, his life first. And I want to say I'm pretty disappointed in myself for not knowing about him prior to his passing. He truly is like out of every celebrity, even like not true crime cases, just celebrities in general. He is such a fascinating individual. So multifaceted. I mean, truly very, very talented. This case does extensively cover mental health and depression. If that is something that is very hard for you to listen to right now, please protect your peace and I'm going to see you in the next episode. So after the disclaimers, again, I'm not an expert. I just really wanted to understand the story and gather as much information as I could and present it to you. Let's get into the case. Sushant Singh Rajput was found dead June 14th of 2020. And the news of his death was, I mean, clearly devastating, not just for his massive loyal fan base, but just for all of India and really for everyone. Sushant was an actor that even if you weren't that invested in his projects, like even if you didn't go to see all of his movies or his shows, he was very easy for the general population to respect. He had dropped out of one of the most prestigious engineering programs in the entire nation to pursue his passion, his dreams of acting. He had this energy about him. He took his craft seriously. He was incredibly humble. He had deep introspective thoughts that he shared with the world. He was one of those actors people would always say, we need to protect him from like the seedy grips of the entertainment industry. He's one of the good ones. And now that he was gone... At first, everyone, including the police, was like, wait, what happened? So the police released information that while he was home with his three roommates, he decided to cut his life short. And they claimed that it seemed like a case of mental health and the hardships of being in the entertainment industry. That's what they said. But this news, it very quickly starts spiraling into something much more sinister. Because we find out that one of his roommates, who happens to be a good, good friend of his gets arrested, gets detained. And then his girlfriend, a fellow Indian actress, that they had like a secret relationship, she also gets detained and arrested. Mm. And theories start flooding Twitter that indicate that literally nothing is what it seems in this case. So before we get into all of the theories, I, I do want to say I feel like Sushant's life does kind of get lost in some of the case theories. So I just want to talk about him in depth real quick in case that you don't know him, just like I didn't really know him going into this. And he really is remarkable. I feel like, okay, there's always an interesting dynamic when a family of sons, like only sons, finally has a daughter. Or like when a family of only daughters has a son. And I'm not saying like that couple, they were waiting for this to happen or that's the only reason they kept having kids, but it's just... It's an interesting dynamic. So the Singh family, they had four daughters and Mrs. Singh fell pregnant once more and the whole family was so shocked and they were so excited that this time they were having a son. And again, I don't know if it's like the patriarchy or maybe it's just something different. You're like, oh, this is weird. This is different. I wonder how it's going to impact our family dynamics. And there were a lot of nerves. The parents were like, we don't know how to take care of a son. We have four daughters. We're like girl moms and dads. But the minute that Sushant was born, every single family member babied him. Literally, all four of his sisters felt like his second mom. He was smothered with love and attention. And it wasn't just because he was a boy in a patriarchal world. But he just, um, he like had something about him. That's what everyone says. He was just charismatic from the day that he was born. And it was like one of those things that either you have it or you don't. And he had it. And you know, I get it. The term mama's boy it's got a super negative connotation so i don't even want to use it to describe sushant 
but he was a mama's boy in like the best way possible. Like he was stuck to his mom, just super glued to his mom every single day. And he let her influence his life in ways that sometimes some sons may, may not have wanted. It wasn't a situation where he was like, when I grow up, I want to be just like my dad. Sushant was very much, I want to be just like my mom. I want to be compassionate. I want to be and show my emotions. I want to wear my heart on my sleeve. I want to express myself, which how many guys can you think of in a strong patriarchal society that can confidently say that? Like, it's really impressive. He also grew up in like a small town that wasn't known for being, you know, like, you know, sometimes cities have a faster pace of thinking. So this was kind of different. And he grew up with the name Gulshan, which means rose garden. And again, most boys his age would have been like, mom, don't call me that. Like, that's embarrassing. I'm not a rose garden. I'm like a supercar garden. But he was just so into it. He embraced it. I mean, even with all of his older sisters, he let the feminine energy around him shape him and just form him into this very intelligent, charming person. So all in all, he's not the type. To be like, oh, why do girls do this? Like he seemed to have a deep understanding of women and people in general. But he was also undeniably shy growing up. He especially hated public speaking, which is kind of shocking considering he goes on to be like a huge actor. But his family said that he would even skip school to avoid giving presentations. Yeah, it was really intense. So with a lot of time, a lot of effort, Sushant finally comes out of his shell by around high school time. And I would describe his high school years as very dynamic. He's a bit of a joker. He's a bit of a class clown. So Sushant and his friends were constantly kicked out of the classroom because they were always cracking jokes and they would be forced to hold their ears in the hallway, which is like a very typical punishment in Asia. It's giving class clown energy. But he was also somehow so laser focused on his studies. Like you look at this guy in class and you're like, there's no way he's smart. All he's doing is goofing around, making jokes, and he's got all the friends in the world, but then he's always ranked number one in the class. And you're like, okay, this is life is so unfair, you know? But you can't even hate him because he's so nice and humble and he makes you laugh and you're like, I'm over this, okay? (laughs) He was also really, really tall, a little over six feet tall, I believe, which becomes pertinent later. He was also kind of a heartthrob. He was nicknamed Casanova by his teachers because he was that popular with the girls. And I think that people were just really drawn to the contrast. So he was studious, but he was also very mischievous. He loved having intense philosophical conversations about the universe, about humanity, about astrophysics. And then he would turn around and crack a lighthearted joke about poop you know like just you're like how is this the same person it doesn't make sense he looks like a bad boy he looks like a casanova but he's so in tune with people's emotions and so empathetic you're like all right i don't know what's going on but it's kind of wild it's not hard to imagine that he would have a ton of admirers and then in 2002 everything kind of changed this was a moment that he stated himself had changed his life as an individual forever December 10th of 2002, he gets a call at around 11.30 p.m. This is pretty late at night, and it's his mom. So usually they talk on the phone every night at around 7.30 p.m. And side note, um, Sushant was away in Delhi for schooling, so he was away from his whole family because there was better opportunities for high school in Delhi. So he's like in a dorm situation, like high school boarding. And he gets a call, and he's like, okay, this is weird. My mom should be asleep. We only talk at like 7.30. Why is she calling near midnight? He picks up, and his mom is kind of crying softly. He's asking, is everything all right? She's reassuring him, no, 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 nothing is wrong. Don't worry about me. But I was just wondering if you could take some time off school and come see me. And Sushan is torn. On one hand, he wants to go. He wants to rush to his mom because it feels like something is wrong. But on the other hand, he had exams coming up. He had big due dates for school. And he thought, okay, maybe my mom is just sad that we're apart. Because you have to remember, they were so close growing up. And this is part of growing up, right? This is part of the pains of learning how to be an adult. And he tries to soothe his mom, and eventually he helps her calm down. And they both hung up feeling better. Sushant's like, Mom, I gotta stay in school. I have responsibilities now. They hang up. Sushant falls asleep. And the next morning, he gets a phone call. His mother had passed away. And that was the last time he spoke to his mom. 
She passed from an almost instantaneous and unpreventable brain hemorrhage. What? Yeah. So I mean. So it was just a medical thing that she passed. Wow. I don't know. Maybe she had a brain tumor. I couldn't find too much on it because it was quite a bit ago. And you know, if you look into him now, everything is flooded with theories on his case. So in a 2016 interview, Sushant recounted, "This was the very last memory that he had with his mom, and he said it was so odd. Like in the last phone call, it's almost like she knew because she told him to take care of himself, and that was just weird. She was 40 something and fine before all of this suddenly happened. Many friends and family they speculate that Sushant just never really forgave himself for that phone call." He would actually write two poems dedicated to his mom when he was just 16. I think the poems show you just not only how much he was hurting, just how introspective he was, like the types of thoughts he was having at 16. One of the poems reads, "Do you remember? You promised you would be with me forever, and I promised you that I would keep smiling no matter what. It seems we were both wrong, mother." And he kept these poems to himself until 2017. He posted them on Instagram. Three years later, he would be found mysteriously dead. No note, no letter. So in college, Sushant is diagnosed with ADHD, but he did everything to not let it hinder him. He went into engineering. And side note, in India, you have to pass the College of Engineering entrance exam. He was ranked number seven in all of India. Not wow. Not just his school, all of India. Wow, that's so intense that they、yeah. ranked the whole. Country, yeah, wow. I mean, this secures him a spot at the Delhi Technological University to pursue a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. This is one of the most coveted and on-demand engineering programs in all of India, the whole country, the world's most populated country. Okay, and I was like, okay, wait, how does he become a Bollywood star? I'm like so deep into his childhood. I'm like. Where is the transition? I don't even understand. At no point did I know where the transition was going to happen, and it's a wild story. So Sushant likes engineering, but he's he's not feeling the passion. I mean, he was beyond grateful to have this opportunity, but he just felt he felt passion in more creative arenas. You know, engineering is creative to a degree, but I wouldn't call it like the most creative industry in the world. And he liked the arts. He liked the sciences. He loved astronomy. He loved physics. He liked to think deeply about the universe, the galaxy. He would stargaze for hours at a time, just contemplating the mysteries of space and how we can transcend what we know as our reality. His ultimate dream was to be an astronaut one day. So he would contemplate the meaning of life, go rank number one in his finals, and then go back to his dorm and lip sync and passionately perform in front of a mirror by himself to the latest new songs. Like this guy was so multifaceted, and this is when he joins a dance group in college. But not just any dance group. He joins a Shyamak Devar's dance group. This is like a dance maestro. Right, he was pretty much credited with refreshing the traditional Indian dance scene by introducing, like, contemporary jazz with traditional Indian dance. He even choreographed some dance scenes in Mission Impossible Four.、Mm. So this guy is a legend. And within just a few months of joining this dance group, Sushant is always front row in performances, which is like big deal for dance groups. Okay, he was even part of the background dancers set to perform at the 51st Filmfare Awards. This is like Oscars. So four years into his prestigious mechanical engineering program, Sushant is like, you know what? I'm gonna drop out and chase my dreams. <laughs> He even performed at the 2006 Commonwealth Games after dropping out, which is a huge accomplishment. And then、uh, Devar pulls him aside and says, Sushant, you are not one of my best dancers. Which, like, okay, why didn't you say that before he dropped out and devoted his whole future to this, sir? But he continues. But. You are always placed in front, not because you're the best, but there is something about the way you express yourself, and it makes me want to see you. It makes me want to pick you. Why don't you try theater? Sushant makes this huge turning point in his life, and he starts practicing acting. And he didn't just go into it thinking, "Okay, well, he said that I should be good, so let me just try it out. Let me just..." 
test the waters, right? He had a very systematic approach to it, just like the way that he studied. He studied various acting techniques, researched actors, even explored all the different ways actors were able to pull off roles so well. He tried method acting at one point. He tried everything. There are some people who wouldn't even have blamed him if he was like, I was number seven in the nation for the engineering exam. How hard could acting be? Like no one would have blamed him if he had that attitude, but he never did. He just always was so humble and like wanted to start from ground zero. He found it very liberating to just play all these different characters and he was able to tap into his own personal emotions that he might have been suppressing and just let it out during these characters' journeys and these stories. And on screen, every character that he played just felt very genuine and just felt almost raw at times is how people describe it. And I feel like, um, okay, I feel like there's a few types of performers or famous people, right? Not that I've like rubbed shoulders with, with a bunch of them, but just from my little classifications. I feel like there's some famous people or performers that want to perform because they think fame and money is good. And they usually just lack stage presence. There's no chemistry, And then you have those that are so good at their craft and they love music, but maybe they don't love performing music. So sometimes these people can have incredible stage presence. Sometimes they cannot. It's just kind of hit or miss. And then you have a group of what I just consider magical people who are so good at what they do, but it's... It, there's almost like a tangible chemistry. They feed off the audience, not because they love fame or praise or like people shouting their name, but they just, they fall into that energy and it becomes like this feeling and this wave that you can feel when they're performing. And Sushant was one of those performers. So he first starts with plays and eventually he lands TV roles, like TV advertising, TV commercials. And talent agents saw this and was like, oh my God, we got to sign this guy which evolved into multiple offers to lead in TV series. And it's said that he left a really good impression on not just the audience, but producers, directors. Like, they all really liked him. And he just kept getting casted in more roles and more roles. And I just imagine it. I mean, imagine how crazy that is. Like, a whirlwind of things happening at once. He's, like, getting thrust into the spotlight. Bookings are flowing in, and the public is intrigued. They're very intrigued, specifically on his love life, by the way. Okay, so he was casted frequently as a romantic lead. He's very conventionally attractive, very tall. He's got the charisma, right? And um, some people might call it soap operas. So to give you an idea, he was, you know, like the romance lead. And so naturally, audiences, they're romanticizing him. They're like, who is he dating? Is he single? We need to know. And he ends up dating one of his co-stars, Ankita Lockhand. And they had some pretty strong on-screen chemistry. So people were really invested on their now off-screen relationship. In 2014, there were rumors circulating that they were secretly married. But it was just a rumor. They debunked it, but it it gets a little crazy. So if I had to come up with a comparison only to help people understand the situation and not because everything is comparable, right? But I'm thinking that their relationship was similar to Robert Pattinson and Kristen Stewart. Kind of that vibe. Like everyone is so invested. Mm, Vampire, right? Yes. like What is it called? Twilight. Twilight. Okay. They had that on-screen chemistry. Now it's off-screen and everyone is so emotionally invested. I mean, they're the it couple. So they come forward to say that they're not married, but they do confirm that they're dating. And they did have some very public emotional moments that just made people more invested in their relationship. So for one, Sushant was on a dance reality competition. So think like Dancing with the Stars. And during one of his performances, he was paying tribute to his late mother through this heart-wrenching, just gut-pulling performance. And when he was done, he was so emotional. Like he had to take a moment to gather himself and collect himself. Uh, judges, the audience members, they were getting choked up. And his girlfriend was there. The famous actress was there. And she rushes down from her seat in the audience, runs onto the stage to comfort him. And it was just so many raw emotions that a lot of viewers, they, they latched onto this couple. And then in January of 2016, Sushant announced that later this year, he wanted to marry Ankita. Wow. But unfortunately, tabloids would reveal that they broke up the same year before they wed. Nobody really knows why they separated, but it does seem like they separated on good terms. Maybe they were both super focused on just making a name for themselves in Bollywood. 
But here's the thing about Bollywood, okay? And this happens in other industries too. The Chinese movie industry, Hollywood. I mean, we were just talking about this with the similar incidents, but really, really wealthy people have children who really, really want to be famous. And then they pressure directors to cast their children as leads, even if their children have questionable talent. Okay, sometimes they're talented, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they have experience, sometimes they don't. And then the movie is so well-funded, they get the marketing down to a T, people go see it, it's not a flop, and a nepotism star is born, regardless of if they worked hard for it or not. And in Bollywood, it's really cutthroat. Being the kid of a wealthy family and being the kid specifically of a huge Bollywood name, you're almost guaranteed a career, a leading spot even. So what does that say about Bollywood and all these other industries, including Hollywood? I don't know. I guess that's up for you to decide. But I will say that it makes people like Sushant even more impressive. To go against that and still make a name for yourself, like that means you really have the talent and viewers really want to see you specifically. Side note, it's so hard to make it in Bollywood as an outsider. That's what they call people like Sushant, people who don't have parents in the industry. It's so hard to make it as an outsider that people actually look down on outsiders that make it. Because the public thinks if you made it as an outsider, that means you did some shady shit to get to where you are. What? And this sentiment is often placed on women in Bollywood, mm. saying that they're willing to sleep oh, with producers yeah, yeah, yeah. or directors to get roles since their family name can't do it for them. Mm. Which, I mean, even if that's true, do we blame the woman or should we blame the system that forces people to feel like that is their only way to put food on their table and follow their passions? So Sushant goes to star in a bunch of hit movies, and in one film, he was depicting a famous cricket player. This was a huge turn for his career. So remember how I said he had always been like this romantic love interest? He'd been in all the soap operas. Now, this is his first serious movie in a biopic about one of the most beloved sports athletes, Mm -hmm. most respect in all of India. Think Margot Robbie going from very sex appeal, these hot girl roles, and then I, Tanya. Like this is a make it or break it for his career. And he watched over 500 hours to get the idea of this famous cricket player's mannerisms, his cadence, his way of carrying himself, not even just him playing cricket, not even him doing interviews, but just any video he could get his hands on. He would even study for hours on end how he walked. Just the way he walked, just the way he stood. Are both of his feet balanced? Does he lean to one side more or the other? Which side is it? Where is his hip placed? He would study it all down to a T. He was coached by another famous cricketer for 13 months. And the movie became the fifth highest grossing Bollywood film in India. No way. It was a huge milestone in his career. He was also the lead in the Indian remake of John Green's The Fault in Our Stars. He won several awards for his performances. But, you know, as his celebrity grew, the more people thought, oh, my God, he must be living his dream life. The more things were kind of weighing on him behind the scenes. It did seem like Sushant, like many others in the industry, was struggling with mental health. He struggled with anxiety and depression, is what a lot of sources close to him stated. And side note about this before we continue. I think we would live in a very scary world if nobody recognized mental health and its role in people making a choice to be done with their lives. But I also think it would be a very scary world to live in where people were like, oh, you're depressed? You must have ended things. Let's not ask further questions. So one thing doesn't lead to the other, if that makes sense. It is stated by a lot of sources close to him that he struggled with depression. And it's theorized that film premieres were the catalyst to these, quote, episodes that he would have. There is so much emotion. I I was thinking about this, okay? Just think about all the emotions tied to film releases. Imagine you've worked all year on a single project, poured your life into it, your heart and soul, and there must be parts that you're proud of, and there must be parts that keep you up at night, and you're thinking, oh man, was that good enough? And now you wait to see if people like it. And people online and people in person, they forget that you're a real person when they critique you for whatever reason that you couldn't even see. If they didn't like you, your chances of getting another job, they just feel like they're flushing down the toilet. The constant evaluation, the judgment, I mean, I can only imagine how overwhelming that is. So he would struggle a lot. And he would struggle pretty silently with his mental health. And I think what's admirable is 
All the while that he was allegedly struggling with all of this, he still wanted to make a difference in the world. So Sushant founded three companies. He worked with the government to sign and endorse the Women Entrepreneurship Platform, a platform that works to build up female-owned businesses. He became a spokesperson for that platform. Then he started a tech company that was aiming to invest $43 million into IP and emerging tech coming out of India. They also allocated nearly $3 million of that money to help support the Women Entrepreneurship Platform. Sushant really wanted to help women. I think he had a lot of feminine influence in his life from his four sisters and his mom, and it, it translates in his passion projects. Then he had another company called Vivid Rage Realty X. So a few things about this company. Sushant started it with two others, an Indian actress named Rhea and her brother. Now, the company worked with mixed reality and AI, but later, after Sushant's death, it was revealed that he was actually dating Rhea. Rhea is going to be a very important character, person, just pivotal person in this case. And it stated that she was actually living with him at one point. She would move out just a few days before he died. Yeah, and she will become the center of today's case, but we're going to get there. But first, I have to walk you through everything. He also founded the Front India for World Foundation, which the sole purpose of that foundation is promoting humanitarian aid. He also co-owned the Delhi Gladiators, a team in the Super Boxing League of India. So he also had really good time management skills. So on top of all of this, on top of his acting and all of his foundations, he would read books on astronomy and the universe. He loved the stars. And it was, it's, it really is fascinating to see. I think passion is almost translates directly to charisma. Just the way that he was so passionate about the galaxy, he's so fascinating. He bought this $20,000 telescope and every single day he would just study the stars. And by the way, this is my time machine. You can see Saturn rings, Jupiter moons, and actually different galaxies, Andromeda also. When, when the sky is... Those are pictures from uh, NASA, actually. So this is when I visited. I got myself a uniform, by the way. I always wanted to be an astronaut. He would read books on physics, astrophysics, quantum physics. He would bring them to sets and read them. And the way that he would explain it to people when people are like, oh, what are you reading? It wasn't this snobby like, astrophysics it wasn't like you wouldn't understand he would explain it in a way that you're like oh my god that's so interesting you would go buy that book and you'd be like oh my god it's so boring like the way he described it was so interesting and this is like so boring i can't even finish this one of his favorite books were the physicist and the philosopher and then the pandemic hit and it was particularly rough in india because it is our world's most populated country and by the time that it was June 2020, I mean, lockdown was in full swing. Sushant was living in Mumbai with a few of his roommates. So he's living with a good friend slash art designer named Siddharth. And they had a live-in chef. They had a live-in staff member. Now, according to the roommates, all three roommates, June 14th of 2020, it felt like any other day. Everyone is stuck at home. Everyone's repeating the same routine. It's yesterday, but on repeat. Sushant woke up in the morning. He went into the kitchen to grab his cup of juice. Normally, he would just quietly read in his room while drinking his juice. At around 11.30 a.m., the chef knocked on Sushant's door to ask, hey, what do you want for lunch and dinner? Like, what would you like on the menu today? There was no response. Just silence on the other end. And it wasn't really like Sushant to fall asleep again or to not be awake at 11.30 a.m. But I guess it's not that big of a deal. You know, it's not the end of the world. So the chef goes back to preparing meals and after a while, the other two roommates come out and he's like, hey, um, I don't know what Sushant wants to eat. He's not responding and his door is locked. So they're like, oh, that's weird. So they walk up to Sushant's door, knock on the door, nothing, not even snoring, shuffling of papers, music, nothing, just silence. Now, Sushant does spend a lot of his time in his room after lockdown, but he had never gone MIA and locked his door like this. So they start getting anxious. They pound on the door. There's no way he's sleeping through this. They're like knocking on the door really loud. Nothing. So they call in a key maker to come and manually open up his door. This is a thing that gets debated later. Some people are saying, why wouldn't you break down the door? Some people are saying, I would just call the cops. Some people are saying, if you 
or calling a key maker. Like, you know, th this point has been debated a lot. It is reported that when the locksmith finally swung open the door, the inside of Sushant's room was uncharacteristically messy. Just so messy. <laughs> and in the middle of his room was Sushant hanging from the ceiling fan. The roommate stated they immediately called the police along with Sushant's eldest sister. The police rush over and they start putting together their tentative timeline. And their timeline goes something like this. June 14th, 2020, Sushant woke up at around 10 a.m. He got his juice, locked his bedroom door. Then sometime between 11.30 a.m. and 1 p.m., he decided to end things. He tried to use like a bathroom robe as a belt around, but it ripped from the weight of his body. So then he reportedly used a green kurta, which is like a long tunic. Side note, there are other reports later that other things were used in this process, but we're going to get to that later. The police stated that there was no note left behind, but they did find antidepressant medication left in the home. So the authorities, they kind of pieced it together and they stated that Sushant was struggling with his mental health and that he was seeing several psychiatrists and undergoing treatment in a hospital in Mumbai. He was prescribed these antidepressants. I mean, the officers stated that they believed that once Sushant would feel better, he would get off his meds. And that is what led him to making this very drastic decision. The police stated that they spoke with Rhea, Sushant's current partner, who had just moved out a few days ago. They spoke with Sushant's father and sisters along with his roommates. And they were going to have an autopsy. They ruled out foul play. And even the provisional postmortem report at the time revealed no signs of a struggle and concluded that the cause of death was asphyxia, which is consistent. So the postmortem, it was conducted at Cooper Municipal General Hospital in Mumbai by a team of three doctors. And keep this in mind later because this hospital goes through a series of allegations and theories. So this comes out to the public and everyone is absolutely devastated. I mean, they found out that beloved Sushant was now dead. And although it was a much smaller revelation, they also discovered that he was dating another Indian actress and... This is why it's so important later, okay? That's why I keep bringing it up. She's so important. But it was rumored that Rhea and Sushant had actually started dating back in 2019. But nothing came of those rumors. They never confirmed it. And then it wasn't until after his death it was officially confirmed. After Sushant's death, it seemed like everyone in India just went into mourning. His family mourned in private. They held funeral proceedings. People that were present said that Sushant's father was utterly broken throughout the entire proceedings. And then on the 27th of June, the family released an emotional statement about Sushant's passing. They said that they, they wanted to celebrate his existence. They wanted to honor his memory, his legacy. They were gonna set up a foundation in his memory to support young, talented artists. And they also mentioned that they would be turning his childhood home into a memorial home for the people that loved him to come and maybe get closure. The sisters said it's not easy. It's like having this giant void in their lives and the pain that they feel without him is just immense, immense. So support from celebrities and oceans of fans, they start pouring in through all the mediums and platforms. Priyanka Chopra even released a statement of condolences. I mean, every big name that had ever been a part of Bollywood is in Bollywood. They release statements. And the message, the core of the message at this point in time that everyone was saying was mental health education and awareness needs to be taken seriously. Now, regardless of how you feel about this case and your theories on it, this is still a good message. This is a message, regardless of what theory is the truth, should be spread. So the message was, these types of deaths can be prevented. We don't really know what someone is going through. We need to be kinder to one another. We truly don't know how someone is feeling at any given point. Even the Indian prime minister tweeted his shock over Sushant's passing and praised him for being an inspiration to so many people. I don't want to say like this sounds normal because that's, that's weird, but this felt standard for what happens in the industry when a tragic death happens. People tweet about mental health awareness and then the next time something else happens, another person gets ripped apart and then another tragic death and then it's all about mental health and then we're all just kind of like stuck in this loop. So people were worried it was that. People were like, no, we really need to make sure every, like we're gonna change as a society. And you're like, okay, but how did it turn into whatever is happening now, which almost feels like a burning ball of theories. A few things. 
At first, it felt more like cautious speculations. People being like, hey, this happened, and I know we're all grieving, but I don't even know if this is okay to say, but you guys don't think that it's weird that his former manager passed not too long ago? Like, are there really that many coincidences in the world? The police also released some information that only fueled public suspicions even more. So according to the Mumbai police commissioner, Sushant had searched for terms like painless death, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder on Google, even in the hours leading up to his death. The police elaborated that they believed Sushant was saddened by the death of his ex-manager. They also speculated that Sushant was worried people might link him to her death for whatever reason. They said, and I quote, he also searched for his online presence, like he would Google his name. And these issues seem to have exacerbated his condition. He Googled his name just a few hours before the incident. And people didn't really like this. The public was like, what? I mean, Disha, the ex-manager's death was already suspicious to a lot of people. And the link was only making Sushant's death even more suspicious. So they're like, "Mm, this doesn't sit right with us, but things are about to get a lot more confusing. So the first inquiry against the ruling of no foul play actually came from Sushant's family, his uncle. His uncle expressed immense grief over the death of his nephew, and he alleged that Sushant would not have done this, that Sushant was murdered. He begged the Central Bureau of Investigation, this is like the FBI, to look into the incident. So very quickly, Sushant's sisters, they join in on the uncle's pleas to the public and they took a stand against the local and state government and they basically asked federal agents to get involved. And they begged the public, we need to put pressure on the CBI so that they actually investigate this case. At this point, Sushant's girlfriend at the time, Rhea, also publicly requested the CBI get involved in his death. So all the people that are closest to him, his girlfriend, his family members, his dad, everyone is saying something is not right here. So dad, everyone. Everyone. Several politicians joined in on demanding a probe from the CBI. More on these politicians later. Anyway, netizens are shocked at this sudden switch up in the news because it went from, hey guys, we need to really bring awareness to mental health, which we still need to do, right? But then it was suddenly, this could be murder. And I think the shock was really big for a lot of netizens. And they felt like the family must have some sort of information because no one just does that. No one just publicly says, no, 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 this is weird. Something must have happened or they must have known about something. Why else would they ask the public for help on getting the CBI involved? So everyone rallies behind the family and they're like, the CBI needs to get involved. Hashtag justice for SSR. Hashtag revolution for SSR. All of these were trending. And the most popular hashtag which was hashtag warriors for SSR, I believe it had 2.1 million tweets behind it. People were riled up. There were protests held with signs that read justice for Sushant. But at this point, I would say that people were still kind of like half and half. Half the netizens were feeling like, no, it was mental health and everyone is just kind of in denial of losing a beloved person. And the other half were saying, mental health, yes, it's very important. And he was probably struggling with mental health, but something's not right about this. It was a huge debate. There was also debates about the credibility of the Mumbai police, and people were even questioning the autopsy. Netizen stated that Sushant's autopsy was performed at a suburban government-owned postmortem center. The autopsy didn't even include the probable time of death, which they thought was so strange. That's like pretty basic in an autopsy. And the autopsy didn't even cite the last meal consumed by the deceased, which again, very, very standard in an autopsy. And it would also give insight to time of death if you know what was in their stomach. And allegedly, the autopsy process was conducted in a room that wasn't even adequately lit. So people were like, the police are saying he did this to himself, but they're not even doing the autopsy correctly. And the family is saying, no, we don't trust the police. We want the CBI involved. So something is happening. Now, the media questioned the postmortem institution and an official associated with the postmortem. They declined to comment on the allegations, which only fueled the allegations even more. And even the entire autopsy is called into question because there's conversation circulating about how there were visible bruises and fractures on Sushant's body that were not depicted in the autopsy. So it is beyond messy. But one thing is for certain. There are still so many questions. A few of the main questions people had were, okay, 
Was his death a part of something larger? What are the odds that his ex-manager had just passed? How is this a coincidence? Why did his girlfriend just move out right before his death? Why are his family members trying to get the CBI involved? What are the police hiding? A month into the social media movement, the CBI started their investigation into the unnatural death of Sushant. Now, before we get into the conspiracies, I do need to cover something heinous. A picture of Sushant's deceased body somehow started circulating all over social media, and it is really despicable that people were sharing this picture. The Bombay High Court had to request restraint from the media houses while reporting on this case because of how intense things were getting and how much more intense things were about to get. So if you're doing your own research, I would just exercise caution because they're pretty easily accessible online. So like I said, this case is like an onion, each layer darker than the rest, and there is no way for me to include all the theories and different aspects and details. So these are just the main ones that kept coming up time and time again. And they can all either be broken down into A, he was murdered, or B, he was not murdered. And even those two theories can be broken down into three big components. Rhea, the girlfriend, then Bollywood, and then he made the choice to end things. So let's start with Rhea, the girlfriend. Why was she even accused in the first place? I do want to mention, though, that, um, the, again, this is not my personal opinion, but just a preface. This is probably one of the more harmful of the theories, because it, if the allegations are true, it hasn't been proven in the court of law, so we can't really be the judge and the jury, right? And if it's false, it has and will have lasting implications on someone's life. Let's try to exercise some caution with our allegations here. To sum it up, the theories against Rhea, they can all be kind of summed up into a few categories. The first theory is that Rhea poisoned Sushant, directly murdered him. The second theory is that Rhea stole his money and that coupled with his mental health struggles, she drove him to his death. The third theory is that Rhea burned through his money and drove him to his death. The fourth is that Rhea isolated him and controlled him to the point of driving him to his death. And the fifth is that Rhea got him addicted to drugs and directly or indirectly led to his death. And lastly, Rhea and the family have a lot of history, and that ends up leading to a whole different world of theories on its own. So like I said, even this theory has so many sub-theories. It's really confusing, but let's just try to tackle it. So the theory or the theories against Rhea started when Sushant's father released a self-made video accusing Rhea of poisoning his son. He said, wow. yeah, he said in Hindi, Rhea was giving poison to my son, Sushant, for a long time. She is his murderer. The investigating agency must arrest her and her associates. He also alleged that he had no knowledge about his son's mental health struggles. And this becomes important later. But anyway, people, of course, I mean, they freaked out. You're talking about one of a, a huge star in Bollywood is dead and his actress girlfriend is being accused of poisoning him by the victim's father yeah this is huge a few things that didn't sit right with people and again this is just me reiterating what we've gathered from our research but a few things that didn't sit right is Rhea moved out a few days before his death essentially broke up with him six days before his death and people thought that was strange Rhea also came out to say that they were dating after he passed. And if these allegations were true, if she did indeed poison him. Wait, I'm so sorry. You say they were dating after he passed? Yeah, so she oh, basically, oh, she yeah. Explain. Okay, but she, you say she broke up with him six, six days. days. Mm -hmm. And that's what, why she moved out. Yeah, and okay. then after he passed, she was like, oh, you know, we were dating and he passed and I'm grieving now. Mm. And so netizens are now like, wait a minute, we were sympathizing with her because we didn't even know that they were dating. And of course, losing, losing your loved one, especially your partner is devastating. But now you're being accused of poisoning him. So if you broke up with him, poisoned him, and then you went on social media to be like, this is my boyfriend who passed. Netizens were like, oh my God, this would be so, so bad if this, are, if this were true. So the CBI, they take these allegations seriously and they seek out help from a panel of forensic experts that specialized in drugs. And the task force testified that there were no organic poisons or toxic substances and or chemicals found in Sushant's body. They did, however, agree that parts of the autopsy done earlier in June needed a closer examination. So it's a very kind of like a weird statement, but um, they did rule out the idea that Rhea poisoned Sushant. So then the theory that Rhea was involved would later evolve. 
and Mr. Singh, Sushant's father, would file a first information report, like a police report, against Raya and five other people. He now accused her of not poisoning his son or of outright murdering Sushant, but for abetting in him ending his life. So there are a few parts to these claims. The first part was that it was alleged that Raya was taking advantage of Sushant and spending his money. It was further alleged that she was actually stealing money from him. It was reported that Raya had illegally transferred $1.8 million from Sushant's bank account into her own and that drove him to end things. Mr. Singh said in the report, My son was at the peak of his acting career till May 2019. During that period, Raya and her relatives developed an acquaintance with my son under a deliberate conspiracy so that Raya could establish herself in the film industry and with an eye on Sushant's wealth. So his dad is basically alleging that Ray and her family members plotted for her to date Sushant so she could gain industry connections and so she could take his money. Raya and her brother were questioned for like 10 hours as a result of the report filed against them. And side note, there are people on the flip side that argue that this whole idea that she was a mastermind manipulator and essentially a quote gold digger that everyone is portraying her to be, they argued against this. They said it just doesn't make sense, you know? Because they said that she was friends with one of the most powerful directors in all of Bollywood. So they're arguing if there's anyone for her to be sucking up to or spending time with and being nice to, it would be that director and not Sushant. It was even further alleged that this very powerful director allegedly told her to break up with Sushant because his, quote, mental health problems were only going to get worse. He told her to, quote, get out before it's too late. Anyway. They start investigating the money trail, if you will, and it was revealed that $1.8 million was never transferred. But I did read that some people didn't believe that because allegedly Raya lawyered up with one of the most powerful rich attorneys in the area, and people were questioning how could she even afford a powerful attorney? And then others were arguing that the attorney was doing it pro bono to get press. So you see how everything, there's like two sides to it, mm, mm-hmm. right? There's always, if there's a point A, there's almost always a point B. And it's just which point do you believe is more plausible? There were, however, smaller transactions made between Raya and Sushant's bank accounts. And Raya said it was evidence of just any normal loving couple that would transfer money in and out once in a while. That's it. But this is where things get even trickier. It was revealed during this investigation that Sushant didn't have as much money as the family believed he had. And in came the new theory. Rhea was blowing through his money, living her best life on his dime. Now, when I say like in came the new theory, it sounds like I'm saying like, oh, this theory didn't work out. So they're moving on to the next theory. That's not kind of how it went. So they were compiling evidence and new evidence would come out that would kind of bolster their theory. So it's not like they were like, oh, this theory was shut down. Let's just reach for the next one. Mm, Yeah. So this is a gradual development of theories as evidence is pulled and as witnesses come forward and say things about the couple and say things about the situation. Now, anyway. She was blowing through his money and living her best life on his dime was the new allegation. And that coupled with his anxious state of mind, it led him to the breaking point. Rhea and Sushant went on a whole trip through Europe that he paid for. And Rhea argued differently. She said, no, like, that's not what happened. I was actually there for a shoot. And he told me, let's make a trip out of it. And he paid for it because he wanted to. So... She also argued that it was on this trip in Europe that she actually realized how bad Sushant's mental condition was. She said, when we were leaving for Europe, Sushant mentioned that he feels claustrophobic on the plane. He took uh, medicine, which can be used for sleep disorders because he had already had the medicine on hand from his prescription. And when we reached Paris, he did not leave his hotel room for three days. Before the trip, he said he was so happy. He had told me that he was very excited for the trip as it would allow him to show me his true side. You know, he could walk on the streets with me and have fun with me without being hounded by the press and the media and paparazzi, which he can't do in India. And we were just really happy. And I always did wonder what happened. She said things were okay again in Switzerland. But once they got to Italy, his health started deteriorating again. He reportedly started having anxiety attacks and she said that he stayed mostly in the hotel room, just cooped up. She claimed he shared his story of having depressive episodes back in 2013, that he was like opening up about meeting with a psychiatrist in this hotel room. And she said, you know, after he opened up for a while, it was fine for a second, but then his episodes came back 
and he started feeling more depressed and more anxious and we actually had to cut our trip short. And on the allegation that Sushant's family made that she was living off his money, she said, I had a fashion shoot there. Like, that's why we made a trip of it. And she even stated how uncomfortable she was with Sushant's spending. But she didn't feel like she was in the position to even question it. She's like basically saying he's a lavish spender, Mm -hmm. which a lot of people didn't like. She alleged that he previously went to Thailand with six of his male friends and spent $85,000 on the trip. She said he liked spending his money on everyone, not just her. She said he loved living like a star. That's just how he was as a person. She also stated that they were a couple and not mooching off of each other. Then there was the control theory, the control allegations that Rhea was so obsessed with controlling Sushant for whatever reason, it led him to a state of isolation coupled with the fact that he wasn't in a good place mentally, it just spiraled out of control. But I would say the allegations here are a lot more serious than I just made it seem. So the Singh family came out outright and accused Rhea of holding Sushant hostage at one point for up to three months. They stated that they contacted the police at the time, telling them that Sushant is not in good company and they need to check up on him and make sure that no harm was done to him. They said, and I quote, by the time that we found out, it was too late. He was under complete control of Raya. But Mumbai police came out to say that the Singh family never filed a written complaint to the police in the past about this. That when they were asked to file a written complaint, the family responded that they would resolve it informally. So you have people being like, oh, so the family lied. But then you have other people being like, no, the family didn't lie because think about it. Your son is an actor. Do you really want to file a formal public police complaint and destroy his career potentially? Or would you say, okay, I tried to get the police to help, but now they want me to file a formal complaint. So never mind. I'm not going to do this. We'll just figure it out ourselves. So there's both sides to the argument. Now, Rhea came out to say that this was false. She said that she was a young woman and it's not like she was keeping him hostage with guns or weapons. If his family felt like she was a danger to him, they could have easily taken him away from her. She also stated that she was being attacked for no reason and the truth should prevail. But there were other rumors circulating at this time that former female colleagues and friends of Sushant's came forward and they stated that Rhea was super controlling and forbid him from talking to any woman that she didn't approve of. So the theory online was that in a time that he needed someone to help him, to be with him, he was isolated from his loved ones and friends. And then we have the drug theory. There are two parts to this theory, but before we can even touch on those, some cultural context is needed. India has different drug laws than in the US, and I would say India is much more similar to South Korea in the sense that they take any and all drugs very, very, very seriously, including weed. And it's not just legally speaking, there are huge societal connotations when someone is discovered to be doing drugs, even weed. And that might play a role into how people reacted to this news. So the first Rhea drug theory is slightly more conspiratorial than the other one. But um, this is that Rhea was a drug dealer and she was like running a drug mafia inside of Bollywood. That she was running narcotics through Bollywood. And part of this theory was that Sushant was not okay with this or he discovered how big the drug usage was in Bollywood and he was going to tell someone or report her. So she broke up with him and then drugged him to end him and staged the crime scene this specific theory appears to have been proven false because of the toxicology reports but there are those that argue that the toxicology reports as well as the autopsy were done under very suspicious conditions so can you even trust them the second theory was brought up by Sushant's family. They stated they believed Rhea led Sushant to drugs in bad faith, knowing what it could do to him. They claimed that she showed a blatant disregard for his life. They stated that she took actions that any other reasonable person would know would cause just harm and subsequently contribute to him dying. Like anyone else would have known giving someone like that drugs would not be a good story, would not be a good end result. Basically saying she knew that he wasn't in a good place mentally. She knowingly gave him drugs, even though it made no logical sense to do so. And that cut his life short. The only problem with this is this would be very hard to prove in the court of law because they are alleging that not only was Rhea irresponsible, but she was irresponsible on purpose with the intention of harming Sushant's life. There were apparently chat logs between Rhea and her friends where she asked them for weed. And allegedly there were also messages that depicted Rhea asking for MDMA, which this was pretty damning in the sense that 
you know, there's such strong anti-drug culture in India. But the most damning, objectively speaking, is allegedly there is a text sent by Raya to a friend that said, quote, use four drops in coffee, tea or water and let him sip it. Give it 30 to 40 minutes for it to begin. Many Nezin stated that it sounds like she's giving instructions on how to secretly drug someone and could him be referring to Sushant? Was she giving instructions to her friend on how to drug Sushant? Sushant's live-in staff member also alleged that she once asked him to help roll a joint. There's so many parts to this, okay? But to entertain the theory, if MDMA was used, it could have exacerbated whatever was already happening in Sushant's mind. MDMA directly affects the nervous system. It can lead to confusion, lack of independent thinking, and shaky hands. And once it wears off, people report feeling incredibly empty and dull. It should be noted, though, that Rhea and her lawyers have come forward publicly to state that she never used drugs in her life, and she claimed she had never seen these chat logs ever and that they were basically fake. Plus, her lawyer stated that she was willing to take a drug test whenever in order to prove that she had never used drugs. Some netizens believed her, others believed this was a bluff. But these chats opened sort of like a Pandora's box that nobody was expecting. After these messages were leaked, the Narcotics Control Bureau began investigating alleged drug use in Bollywood. And in September 2020, they filed charges against Raya and 34 others. What? They stated they believed Raya acquired multiple deliveries of weed from others on behalf of Sushant. The charge sheet further stated the accused Raya formed a criminal conspiracy to operate an entire network of drug trafficking to distribute illegal substances like weed, LSD, and cocaine in high society and Bollywood. That same month, Raya and her brother were arrested. Raya was jailed for 28 days before being released. And uh, it should be mentioned that a human rights attorney slash activist visited Raya in jail and she stated that Raya was a scapegoat in this case. So lots of high profile people getting involved and putting in their opinions. And it's almost like becoming a war. Raya was granted bail and her charges were dismissed. The judge stated that Raya was not part of the chain of drug dealers and she didn't forward drugs procured by her to somebody else for monetary or other benefits. But then it gets even stranger because the minute that she's released and her charges are dismissed, remember that roommate slash designer slash good friend of Sushant's? He gets arrested. They claim that he helped procure weed for Sushant, but he too was granted bail and released. So they're saying that <clears throat> one, one of them, it sounded like, gave Sushant weed. Yes. Which caused his death? So there, this was more of like a social debate. Um, maybe less so legally. The legal aspect was the Narcotics Bureau was just trying to put anyone in jail that was selling or doing drugs. Mm -hmm. And then the social aspect was whoever gave him drugs could have indirectly led to his death. Okay. So okay. I, I'm, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's not like, hey, we need to put this person in trial today, but it's more of who, who helped okay. was the sentiment. And then some people do believe that he was drugged. And the toxicology reports are lying. So that's the incredibly brief summary of the drug theories, which honestly, you can explore more online. I didn't want to dive too deep into it because again, it's so hard to tell which pieces of information were verified, which pieces were debunked. And there's so many sides to each sub argument. There's another sub argument and then it goes down and it's, it was a lot. So just to give you like an idea of how the process went, um, we would come across a new piece of evidence in like a, well, I don't want to call it evidence, a new piece of the puzzle in like a Reddit post or like a tweet. And then we would try to run it by the researchers as well as looking ourselves to see if there were verifiable sources that were reporting on it. And then it was just kind of creating these webs of theories. And sometimes we would find nothing. Sometimes it would pop up in another thread. It was just really difficult to pick out which details were pertinent and which ones to keep or not. So please, if there's any important details that I've overlooked, I would love to see your thoughts in the comments. Now we head into the next theory, which is the rivalry between Sushant's sisters and Rhea. So after the drug allegations came out, Rhea filed a counter report against Sushant's sisters. Well, two of his four sisters. Rhea was now alleging that it was actually Sushant's sisters that were procuring drugs for Sushant. In the FIR file, she alleged that they had a doctor write a fake prescription in order to get banned anti-anxiety meds for Sushant just a few days before his death. She asked the police to investigate if the drugs given to Sushant by his sisters resulted in the fall of his mental health. 
Sushant's sisters filed a petition to dismiss the case. The file was dismissed for only one of the sisters, and later it was handed over to the CBI for investigation. Now, the main evidence used in this theory were also WhatsApp messages between Sushant and his older sister, Priyanka. Now, this was six days before his death. In the messages, allegedly, Priyanka asked Sushant to try taking three different types of medication that were prescribed for anxiety and depression. Allegedly, Sushant told his sister that he can't get those without a prescription, and Priyanka allegedly assured him that she would make it happen. It's alleged that she said, My friend here is a renowned doctor who can get you connected to the best doctor in Mumbai, all confidential, so don't worry. This went against Sushant's father's statement that he had no knowledge that Sushant was struggling with his mental health, which I mean can still be true. Perhaps his daughters never told him to not worry him, right? But it was also alleged elsewhere that the sisters stated that they had no knowledge of Sushant's depression. But the sisters stated outright, no, we knew that he was struggling with anxiety. So some could argue that maybe they knew that he was anxious, but didn't really quite know that he was depressed. Or maybe they couldn't grasp what depression did. But those in support of Rhea used this against the family to state that they were changing their minds too often. They're like, did you or did you not know that he was depressed? Meanwhile, others stated that Rhea was trying to use the victim's family members who were grieving to get out of a sticky situation. Now, side note, Priyanka actually went on the record to tell the police that Sushant had confided in her in 2013 and in 2019 about having feelings of depression. So the sisters, they start traveling to see him, to check up on him, and they knew that he was diligently consulting a psychiatrist. But Rhea is arguing because of these drugs that were given to Sushant, these three anti-anxiety and depression meds, he ended up taking his life because it was not mixing well with everything that was going on. So he didn't get a doctor's approval. So she's basically saying, we don't even know what these drugs were doing to him. He was already on a different set of meds that he stopped taking. And now you're just like giving him random meds. So yeah, it's a lot and it's very confusing and we've only gone through like one of the three components of theories. But here's why to this day, a lot of people suspect Rhea of being involved. The first part that didn't make a lot of sense to people was that Rhea moved out just a few days before Sushant's death. So what they felt was like, hey, now you're saying that you knew he was in a bad place mentally? How could you leave? So that was a big question that people were having, even if you directly or indirectly didn't do anything with his death. But how could you leave? I guess people just felt like she wasn't a great partner. And some people were saying being a great partner does not make you involved in someone's death. So it's kind of, you know, where do you draw the line? Some people were also saying a grown man's mental health condition is not something like what if it was hurting her mental health condition? But she stated that the reason she left was because she was fed up. She did not want Sushant to take these medications that his sister was giving him. They argued and she left. Many people did not like that. Many people also did not like the way that Rhea was talking about Sushant after his death. She posted on Instagram about her numbness over his passing and her devotion to him and his love. But a lot of netizens felt like, no, but you broke up with him when he needed you the most. And now that he's gone, you like want to say all these beautiful things, right? And they also said you admitted that you knew that he was having mental health struggles and you admitted to blocking him because she admitted to blocking his number and stuff. Hmm. They just felt like it was really callous and really mean, you know? And again, this is not me stating my personal opinion, but rather a compilation of online theories. Nothing has been proven in the court of law, so don't sue me. And a lot of people, I mean, they just really didn't like the whole aftermath of accusations. On one hand, people were saying, how does anyone handle the accusations of that they killed their boyfriend, right? How do you handle that well? But Rhea did some things that were deemed questionable. In an attempt to defend herself and showcase her innocence, she went on an interview and spoke about how Sushant was already addicted to weed before meeting her and was a lavish spender. She claimed Sushant's family knew about his weed addiction and she was the only one trying to help control his addiction. She stated she wished to not have to speak up about all of this and wanted to keep Sushant's memory pristine and beautiful, but the family had opened the Pandora's box and she felt like she had no choice but to defend herself. Sushant was taking drugs or he was having weed. 
Yes, it's unfortunate that we have to speak about him in this light. Uh, but it's not been done by me. The Pandora's box has been opened by his family. They have put these allegations. Um, I wanted his memory to be pristine and beautiful because he was a beautiful boy. Uh, but in turn, these allegations are being put on me. And the fact remains that yes, Sushant used to smoke marijuana. And uh, I tried my best to control him quite to make him stop. This was the only department where I was trying to control him in something. I was trying, trying to make him reduce it, in fact. And um, I have been put in a position where, unfortunately, every single private detail of my life or my friends' lives, a simple I am sorry is taken and blown out of proportion. And me being treated like I am worse than a terrorist, mm -hmm. my family's mental health being destroyed. This is this is like the systematic breakdown of an entire family. She also mentioned that Sushant's farmhouse was used by friends and family in Bollywood to indulge in drug field parties. And one of his sisters was aware of it and had even taken part in the drug field parties. She said... This is her allegation, Rhea's allegation. She claimed Priyanka and her husband used to do drugs with Sushant. Rhea also name dropped a ton of others that allegedly went to parties and did drugs with Sushant. She name dropped a famous actress, a filmmaker, like it was a lot. She also claimed that Sushant had a horrible relationship with his father. I don't know how much of that is true, but I think the phrasing just rubbed people the wrong way. It just, it, it was weird. And then videos started circulating at this time of Sushant speaking very highly of his family, especially his father, in multiple interviews. So people felt like she was kind of trying to like rewrite history. So people stated her credibility was squashed a little bit with that. And another thing, I think it reminded people a lot when a family member gets a new partner who, for whatever reason, doesn't want them to be close with their own family. And I don't know how much that... Very universal, I guess, maybe relatable feeling transferred to Rhea. Because that was like the really strong energy people believed her statements gave off. Whether it was true or not, whether or not she meant it that way or intended to communicate that message, that's how a lot of people felt. Another thing was people wondered what was going on and her change of heart. Originally, when his death was first announced, she wanted the CBI to look into his death because she was like, this is suspicious. She was part of the family that was like, oh my God, you, the CBI needs to get involved. But then later she was adamant that it was mental health problems. Some people didn't like that. Others said it's not a big problem at all. Like as new evidence arises, you can change your mind. In the end, though, this all just added to the witch hunt that Rhea was subjected to, either, in your opinion, deservedly or undeservedly. And with Rhea, a lot of people believe that she's innocent, and just as many people believe that she was a manipulative mastermind. I will say, though, that my researchers told me some context to remember is there is strong gender implications in this theory. They were telling me how for women, especially famous women, they're expected to act a certain way, uh, typically docile, very reserved, and if they're even a bit more aggressive or vocal than that, like if they're not a soft girl or they have traits that aren't typically associated with society's idea of a soft, perfect woman, they're very easily villainized. You know, being vocal or setting boundaries can easily be depicted by the media as being evil, as having something to hide. And I'm not trying to say the whole population of India feels like this, but there were a lot of people who were really loud about it and they were overpowering the others. The thing with the Raya theories is that some people think that she's guilty for a wide plethora of reasons. And a smaller group of people, a tiny group of people, I hope, have jumped onto the idea that she's guilty because they just want to hate her. Right. And it's those people that have made it very hard to have real productive conversations about the case. And they're not saying this itself debunks any theories like my researchers are not saying like, oh, this is the reason that Rhea is innocent and all these theories are false. But it's just some context to remember because this case is so nuanced. There's so many layers and aspects that we have to consider in every single theory. So they were saying how Rhea didn't behave the way that everyone wanted her to after Sushant's death. They wondered if the public would have maybe eased up on her even a little bit if had she had tucked her tail and reacted in a more docile way that people wanted her to react in. In fact, Sushant's sisters were called out for having patriarchal paranoia by a group of people, which is the idea that a son's girlfriend or future wife is going to alienate him and try to be the most important figure in his life. And they are generally seen as competition rather than part of the family. So a group of people felt like the sisters had problems with Rhea and they were now bringing it into this case. 
But others argued that even some of Sushant's friends complained that this was happening and it wasn't just family. They felt like he was allegedly being forced to pull away from their friendships. Also, it's argued and alleged Rhea didn't text Sushant's family back when they kept asking her about how his mental health was. Allegedly, she ignored them, right? And people are arguing, okay, well, now that Sushant has passed, she's taking on this narrative that she has saddened that his family doesn't like her for whatever reason, but it kind of makes sense if they wouldn't like her. That's the online argument that I see. But I guess the Rhea theories, they end with just one big question that everyone keeps throwing at her, which is why did she move out before his death? That's like the thing that I keep seeing coming up time and time again. Now, there are no reports to back up what I'm about to say, but it kept popping up in various different research. So there is a rumor that Priyanka, one of Sushant's sisters, got drunk one night while partying with Sushant and Rhea. Rhea went to bed early and apparently, allegedly, Priyanka later in the night got into the bed and tried to touch Rhea. This is a completely unconfirmed rumor. I keep seeing it everywhere. I literally didn't even want to put it into this episode. But the fact that it just like kept coming up over and over and over again, I was like, okay, I feel like people will be upset if I don't mention this because it was such a big aspect at one point of the case. But there is no proof of this anywhere. And I don't know, something about the allegations against the deceased family members is... Anyway, so... Like I said, Rhea legally hasn't been proven to be guilty of any of the crimes. And that's not to say that any of the reason that people speculate she's guilty aren't weird or they're not like true. It's just nothing has been proven at this point in time. So we just have to exercise caution. Side note, whether you believe she's guilty or not, I will say that she has faced a lot of death threats and some essay threats from the public. Like people have been really nasty to her, whether you believe it's deserved or not. But it is... um. It's just, you know, a part of the case that I think we should mention. There were other people that were also dragged into it, film directors, other A-list actors, actresses. Some people were even getting threats. There was one director who got a threat that his elderly mom and his young infant child better watch out. Yeah. Why? People were saying that he was the one that was trying to get him blacklisted, like trying Mm -hmm. to get Sushant blacklisted. And it was a whole thing. And what's very intense about this case, and you know, most of the time with cases like this, it's usually social media that starts spreading different theories around, right? And the mainstream media usually stays silent on all the theories. Well, mainstream media went into every single theory on Sushant's story, just nonstop posting of different theories every single day, taking speculative reports and almost stating them as facts just to get clicks. A lot of people felt like mainstream media clicks were dying down because of the pandemic. Nothing really was going on. I mean, how many times are you going to turn on the news and be like, okay, here are new numbers. Life is depressing. Back to bed. So they just latched onto this case. They stated this case had all the elements of a Bollywood thriller and all it needed was the ultimate villain. And some argued that's why Rhea was casted as the villain and they believe that she's innocent. So I would... Okay, just to sum it up, I would try and categorize the viewpoints into three groups of, well, four groups of people. The first being that they absolutely believe that Rhea had direct or indirect role in Sushant's death. So she may not have murdered him outright, but she played a big role in him passing away. The second group of people go the complete opposite way. They hate everyone for almost ruining a woman's life and career with no strong evidence and think that she is innocent and has tried her absolute best with Sushant. They also feel like she is taking the fall for everything, including things that she should not be taking the fall for for example they argue the fact that she got weed for sushant they were arguing that sushant is a full-grown man and that she shouldn't be held liable for that some argue that weed is also known to help symptoms of depression i don't know if this is medically true i am making no personal statement on that but that is what is being argued online then we have a third group of people the group that believe maybe she didn't have a role in his death but we don't really think that she's a good person you know Like, they argued that even if she didn't intentionally hurt him, she did questionable things like procure drugs for him, regardless of if he's a full-grown adult. They argue that she knew that he was on a slew of different medications and potentially not in the great state of mind. And then lastly, the fourth group of people is people that don't feel like they know enough to form a solid opinion. So again, regardless of which theory you believe, it's just kind of interesting that the mainstream media was involved in the conversations. And it really doesn't even just stop there. Politicians were getting involved in Sushant's case. And it wasn't just tweets of like thoughts and prayers talking about mental health or even talking about crime rates. A lot of politicians were extremely vocal on how Sushant was murdered. 
So this is where the conspiracies get even more complicated. You could argue that politicians are just like us. They have their own theories about real life events and they want to stand up for the people that they feel have been wronged. They want justice. But even the many people who believe that Sushant was murdered, they had problems with the politicians getting so involved because it just felt like, and again, I don't know if the comparisons are appropriate, but sometimes they help me convey the message in a way that I think makes the most sense. But it's like when random politicians are hyping up BTS. And for some reason, you just know that they're not really fans of BTS. And it just feels like they're tweeting these things Mm -hmm. because their social media team told them to. And it's just like something is very weird. Like you feel, Mm -hmm. it doesn't feel genuine. I see. And you can't really put your finger on it because they're saying the right things. They're, you know, saying all these things that feel like they're passionate, but they're, it's weird. So it, was kind of like that in Sushant's case, it's argued, but obviously to a much more serious and bigger degree. But some of the politicians, it felt like they were just trying to get votes. They were trying to gain relevance. And some of these politicians were not well known prior to this. Nobody even knew about them enough to vote for them. And this being such a divisive case, if they took a stand, the people who also had the same stance would follow them. Objectively speaking, it was a very smart way for them to get support for the next time elections would roll around. So there were politicians who self-produced multiple long YouTube videos about themselves and nobody cared. And it wasn't until they got involved in this case that the general public was like, who are you again? Oh, okay, you're a politician. Now, politicians thinking Sushant was murdered was one thing, but a lot of them straight up went after real faces and names in Bollywood. And all that is to say is... This just thrust the case into even more spotlight and even more questions were going unanswered. And then the Wikipedia owner got involved. The owner of Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales. So if you visit Sushant's wiki page, his death is listed as self-inflicted. People wanted that changed. And Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia said, dear fans of Sushant Singh Rajput, Wikipedia is based off facts, not Twitter campaigns. Wow. Which is... A pretty like strong divisive take yeah so yeah needless to say this case was only growing bigger by the day there are a few theories now about bollywood and how bollywood murdered sushant so let's get into those so the raya theories are kind of done and then we have the bollywood theories the first theory being that this was a premeditated murder orchestrated by powerful individuals in the film industry This theory speculates motives ranging from professional rivalry to attempts to suppress Sushant's potential discovering about the truth of the industry, you know? So let's start with the rivalry theory. It was alleged time after time Sushant was either snubbed for awards or even had movie roles taken from him for the sole reason that he wasn't a Nepo baby. If he's not a Nepo baby, it's hard to control him. He wasn't a puppet for the elites. This is how the theory works, right? He was someone that could think on his own. He had a moral backbone. He was incredibly intelligent, emotionally very, like his EQ was high. So it was argued that they wanted to squash him out of the industry and they tried multiple times. They drowned him with like anonymous negative reviews. So people were saying for how beloved he was at the time that he was still alive and still performing, he had random, like really random negative reviews. Like, negative reviews that said that he was an egotistical like maniac on set and then everyone that worked with him was like he was amazing he's so kind so down to earth so humble so it was like the exact opposite right it it just felt like someone was out to ruin his reputation is what this theory states now of course this theory can also be broken down into two sub theories And one theory is that people believe that he was literally killed by the elites in Bollywood, literally murdered. Others believe that the Bollywood elites did everything they could to make him feel like he had no choice but to end things. A very famous actress stated that the powerful Bollywood studio owners, influential filmmakers and movie critics pushed Sushant over the edge by their alleged lack of support for him. She stated that his mind was systematically dismantled bit by bit by their actions and neglect. So it was implied that he was driven to his choice by a nepotistic industry that neglected his talents, bullied him every chance they got. As proof, several other Bollywood actors and filmmakers were tweeting about it. And they tweeted, I know the pain Sushant was going through. I knew the story of the people that would let him down so bad he would weep on my shoulders. I wish I was around the last six months. I wish he could have reached out to me. What happened to him was their karma and not his. 
Another tweeted, it's no secret Sushant was going through very tough times for the past few years. No one in the industry stood up for him, nor did they lend him a helping hand. To tweet today is the biggest display of how shallow the industry really is. No one here is really your friend. R.I.P. Another just cryptically tweeted, the Bollywood Privilege Club must sit down and think hard tonight. P.S. No, don't ask me to elaborate any further. Side note, it also angered a lot of people that a lot of Bollywood elites started tweeting about Sushant's death and fans came to say, these are the same people that bullied him and tried to push him out of the industry and now they want to act like they were his friends? It's also alleged that he followed a lot of the Bollywood elite on Instagram and they never followed him back. And now they're like tweeting about his death (laughs) and their grief over his passing. So the theory is they wanted him out and he wasn't one of them. They knew that he wasn't able to be controlled. And that's the argument of this theory. They tried to get him out with negative press. Literally, they tried to ruin his career just so that he wouldn't work anymore, have no power, have no influence. Um, They tried to get him unable to book movies, allegedly. They had projects stolen from him, allegedly. And that was the first part of the theory. Now we have to touch on the allegations made against him in 2018. Rhea was actually the first person to really push this into the spotlight after his death and take that as you will. Some argue that she's trying to point the finger in a different direction. Some argue that this is pretty insane. She touched up on the allegations made against Sushant during the peak of the Me Too movements. So in 2018, when hashtag Me Too was gaining traction in India, several big, big names were exposed for predatory behaviors. And Sushant found himself in the midst of one of these allegations. Rumors were circulating that Sushant allegedly made his co-star Sanjana uncomfortable with his unwanted advances on set and that he might have even potentially essayed her. We have no idea how these allegations started. So it's not like Sanjana came forward to claim this and was like, this happened to me too on set. These rumors just started going crazy. I mean, crazy, crazy, crazy. (laughs) But it gets kind of weird. Sushant shared screen grabs of text messages between him and Sanjana that showed a mutually respectful work relationship. And he tweeted, the last thing worth doing is to defend yourself of the fiction created by an agenda. People using this much required campaign for their personal agenda is too much to ignore. So here is the text conversation with Sanjana till the time that I shot for the film. I'll let you decide. Basically saying, like, look at our relationship. It's very professional. It's very cordial. I did not make her feel uncomfortable. I wasn't doing anything with her. Like, I've done enough to prove myself and I'm going to let you guys decide. Sanjana responded to the allegations a month and a half later. She confirmed via Twitter that the accusations were baseless. She wrote, On returning home from a long trip to the U.S. yesterday, I read several baseless and unfounded stories with respect to misconduct and misbehavior on the sets of our film. I'd like to clarify that no such incident took place with me. Let's put an end to all these conjectures. You say a month and a half later? Yeah. So people brought that up. When people brought up, Why did it take you so long to clarify something so important? She said she already felt like the tweet that he gave was clarification enough. And she stated that nobody had the authority to decide if she was late with her response or not. Yeah, nobody has the authority, but this could ruin his life. (laughs) She said that she was never fueling rumors and it wasn't her responsibility to clarify them. Which Hmm. some people can kind of stand behind and they're like... I mean... I don't know that. I mean that. Okay. You can argue that theory if you really want to. Like you can argue it's not her responsibility because it's not like these baseless internet rumors are not your responsibility. But maybe there's something in this specific part of the story that I'm missing. But we tried looking everywhere and I just, I would imagine that if someone was spreading a rumor that I was hurt by another person and I know that this rumor is false and I know that they're getting ripped apart in the media for it, even if I don't like this person, I would clarify the rumors on the sheer fact that I wouldn't want this to become such a big thing that future women and victims are doubted for their stories. Because that's such a big thing. Like women are already doubted for their allegations of abuse. Yeah, I think like she waiting a month and a half definitely shows there's more to the story. Like, I don't know what exactly is the story behind it, but it just shows there's definitely more. You know, if she feel like she didn't have to explain, then she didn't didn't have to explain even a month and a half later. I did see some allegations and I have no idea if this is true, okay? Just people speculating that she was the one that spread the rumors because anyone that was accused in any of the accusers were being thrust into spotlight. But again, I don't... 
Yeah, I mean, these can all be theories. I'm just yeah. saying it's the behavior itself definitely is weird. Yes. It's not normal. Yeah, and I, I mean, I can see maybe that she's getting frustrated that this is getting a lot of attention versus her being a hardworking woman and like all of her skills. But it's just a little frustrating to see that she waited a month and a half. Unless there is something that we're missing here, I find this detail to be unsettling that she waited so long. Now, in a final address to the false allegations, Sushant wrote, it was paradoxical because the Me Too movement was something that I stand for. I happen to be one of the intentional and strategic casualties of it. Many paid campaigners were used to give it a burst. I felt bad and misunderstood. The more it got written about, the more it damages my reputation, which I worked hard to build. So basically he's saying he wanted Me Too to get bigger and bigger because it's so needed in this world. This is a movement that shouldn't be stopped. But the bigger it got, the more his reputation was ruined because people were accusing him of being a predator. So it's almost this like, do I just sacrifice myself for the Mm. better good of the world is the feeling. But it's also kind of unfair because I've worked so hard to build this reputation, you know. But he ended it with, the movement is a good thing. It's all about changing mindsets. So that's the first theory, right? That Bollywood wanted him out and they did everything. And some people believe that Bollywood, the elites, even planted the Me Too allegations, right? And just wanted to stamp out his career. Maybe they felt like he knew something that he shouldn't know, which heads into the next theory. According to Sushant's sister, Sushant had this strange paranoia that people would think that he had something to do with his ex-manager's death, Disha's death. That happened six days ago you're talking about? Before his death. Right, six days before. Yes. Okay. So theories start popping up that Sushant knew that his ex-manager's death wasn't an accident, that it was actually committed by very powerful people, and he was now worried that they knew that he knew and they were going to either set him up for it or kill him for it. Because people were thinking, why would he have that paranoia? I guess the argument there was, it just didn't make sense. It's not like she was his current manager, you know? Like, nobody would was even connecting the dots during the six days. Nobody was like, oh, what if Sushant knows something, right? And allegedly, days before his own death, he was constantly online reading what the media was saying about Disha's incident and whether or not they were mentioning him by name. Others argue that his ex-manager's death understandably had a big impact on him. And perhaps, coupled with the stress of the industry and the fear of being accused for something he didn't do, which he's already felt before, and potentially PTSD from, you know, just the allegations, right? Maybe he was so stressed he couldn't handle it. Maybe there were other mental health issues that caused intense paranoia. But whichever way you believe, his friends and housemates said that he, the frequency of his anxiety attacks increased after Disha's death. So it's argued that the two deaths could be a coincidence or could not be a coincidence. It's also argued that the CBI has stood by their statement that Disha's death was an accident caused by her drinking. Disha's parents have also come forward to say that these are baseless rumors that they do not appreciate about their child. Some have argued that they have been paid to say that. So there's so many like back and forths. I think regardless of if someone believed the Disha theory or the driven to commit theory, everyone was just collectively sick of nepotism and Bollywood in general. Netizens were holding protests and marching for justice. They believed foul play was clearly involved and they stated nepotism in Bollywood played such a huge role in his suspicious death. They also called for the boycott of Bollywood. And in a move that made things even shadier and more frustrating was the police cracked down on these protests and made it nearly impossible to protest. I'm sure that they cited COVID or something else of that sort, but it was just a very questionable move. Now, continuing with the Bollywood theories, it was previously reported that Sushant had allegedly been partying the night before and that influential members of Bollywood elite were attending his party. This made people question whether or not someone at that party the night before did something to him or stole a copy of his keys so that they could come back later. Some people even theorized that he was already dead by the next morning and he wasn't discovered until the next day. Quote, discovered. But it was later stated the roommates, or at least the three roommates, they said, no, 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 like he, we had dinner the night before and he went to bed. Some people don't believe those roommates. Because remember, the autopsy doesn't give time of death. Now, the forensic reports of Sushant's phone and laptop found that he made two calls the night of June 13th. The first call to Rhea and the second call to another good friend of his. Neither of them picked up as they were sleeping. Nothing else came out of that. But it just does indicate to a degree, I guess to a lot of theorists, that he was still alive until the next day. 
June 14th, at around 9 a.m., Sushant was reportedly on the phone with his sister, and it was an hour later that he went to grab a cup of juice. Now, the part that drives people a bit mad is that allegedly, and again, this is so alleged, right? But everyone in the house was like, oh, he had a glass of orange juice. Then another roommate was like, oh, yeah, then he got his pineapple juice. Like everyone had different reports of what juice it was. And it was just like such a small detail that people were like, why does nobody know what juice it is? Hmm. It's like kind of weird, I guess they were saying. And again, I don't know how accurate these allegations are. I don't even, I tried so hard. I went down a juice rabbit hole, okay? I'm like trying to look for explicit quotes from verified sources of the roommate saying specific juices. But everyone was just like, every roommate kept saying it was a different juice. Every media outlet kept saying it was a different juice. You know, so I think it was just like a small detail that people just couldn't shake off. It was very unsettling for them. There were also alleged discrepancies in a ton of other small details, and we're just going to rapid fire through them later in this episode. But on to the next big component of this case, the last component. Of course, we must talk about the theory that he chose to cut his life short. This is the theory that the police seem to be somewhat sticking with. This is not the theory that Sushant's family believe in. Now, you know, I do see quite a lot of people who believe he chose to exit, but they believe that he was basically pushed by a variety of factors. Some people said it was a horribly perfect storm of pressures that resulted in his death. Others blame specific figures in his life like Rayo or specific directors or Bollywood elites. But people who believe this theory state that with the lockdown, with time alone with his thoughts, it was a lot for Sushant. Some sources allege that since October of 2019, Sushant had two doctors diagnose him with bipolar disorder, severe depression, and anxiety disorder. These are allegations. These doctors came out and claimed that Sushant was undergoing what he himself called an existential crisis. Reportedly, side note, I say reportedly because this case is so crazy. There are a lot of arguments and allegations that the doctors that spoke up, some of them aren't even licensed doctors, is an allegation. I saw other arguments that were like, these are licensed doctors, but they're not his doctors. And then some arguments were like, they're literally breaking private records. Because I'm sure India has like their own version of HIPAA. And so the fact that they're saying this for not even, they're not even being subpoenaed in court right now, because that's one thing to be subpoenaed in court. But the fact that they're like going on TV to talk about his private records, that is already suspicious. So it's, you know, like, I don't even know how to feel about any of this. I'm just going to keep saying reportedly because I don't even know anything, right? Anyway, it is reported that he told his alleged psychologist that there were times that he felt like even a minute was many days long. He felt with his bipolar disorder, it was a battle that he would have to fight forever and he would never be able to win. He felt as if nothing in his life was going the way that he expected it to and he felt deeply insecure. Reportedly, he told his psychiatrist there were times he couldn't sleep for days on end, times he would completely lose his appetite for days on end, and times where even just mustering up the energy to get out of bed felt impossible for him. His alleged doctors claim that there was nothing particularly alarming in his life. They claim that his disorder was internal. They stated it could have been a biological serotonin imbalance or some sort of thyroid deficiency. And then another doctor came forward. Side note, literally so many doctors okay um i again i don't think that she's been verified to even be sushant's doctor but please let me know if that is not correct in the comments there was a rumored therapist of sushant's that came forward and spoke to the media about his confidential medical history and she stated that raya was super helpful in helping sushant That Rhea was his strongest supporter and always trying to get him help. They claimed that Rhea was always in touch with them, updating them on his mental health condition and alerting them of particularly bad phases when he would feel extremely low. She showed up to every single consultation. Now, other people argued the opposite, which is that's kind of crazy. Like it seems like that control aspect, that control theory was popping up in Not argument to this, but because of this, right? The rumored therapist stated that Rhea tried to get him to take his meds on time, but the rumored therapist claims that the only reason that Sushant wasn't getting better was because, and I quote, his own ability to not take his medication on time. So she claimed that Sushant would take his medication and he would start feeling a little bit better. And then he would stop taking his medication and then he would resort to yoga and he would try to cure himself without the meds. But then... 
she stated, he would get depressed or anxious again and it would return and would just be much worse than the last time. She said, and I quote, at that time, I informed him about the bipolar disorder and told him that he would get well once he takes his regular medication and proper treatment. But Mr. Sushant said he expected that he should get well and someone should cure him very fast. Okay, so a lot of people have a problem with this statement exactly because Sushant is a man that's very into the sciences. And people that are into the sciences, you know, there is, he was very much into, yeah, philosophy, but also physics and a lot of all these things. And they argued that Sushant would likely know that depression is a chemical imbalance in the brain and it is not something that can be cured quickly. So for him to say like, oh, I expect someone to cure me fast, people were like, that doesn't sound, like it feels inconsistent almost, right? that's not to say that he wasn't feeling depression or anything like that, but that statement is what people had a lot of problems with. It was just kind of a weird statement. Now, she stated, she continued, that's not possible for anybody to cure them quickly of depression. And she stated, also Mr. Sushant said that he was aware of the suffering he was going through, but he was not ready to accept it. I asked him to come in for a clinical examination once again. After that, I saw that he had read a lot about bipolar disorder. I found him sad without any reason. He used to cry even while talking to me. Also, he was feeling highly negative about himself. She stated that a week before his death, Rhea told her that Sushant stopped taking his medication and his mental health was deteriorating. Now, so the therapist has been saying, the alleged therapist has been saying a lot of great things towards Rhea and saying like, no, 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 she's not the reason for his death. In fact, she was really, really trying to help him, right? But with that statement, people were upset. People were saying, okay, you just said that Rhea knew that he was in like, he's hitting rock bottom, but then she left and blocked him. So then I think there's two sides to this argument now of even this statement has become like an argument of like, "Mm," you know, and uh, the therapist continues, I felt like she was taking extreme care of Sushant to get him out of the depression, but he was neglecting his disease. She had also become quite rejected. When I asked why he didn't start taking his medication, he only laughed and didn't say anything. I consoled him and asked Miss Rhea to see you know, if he was taking his medication regularly, but Rhea told me he doesn't listen to her. The doctor has since stated the only reason she's coming public with this is to clear misconceptions. And some people liked that because, you know, Rhea was getting death threats and this is somewhat clearing her name. Other people didn't like that because it's like, that's weird. Doctors don't do that unless you're subpoenaed. Yeah. And I think the tricky part about this case is he could have been depressed and murdered. He could have been depressed and made the choice. So it's, it's, I think the only thing is when depression becomes the point of contention, things get very tricky. So a huge argument that I've seen is, and not by too many people, but you know, in the beginning of this case was that there was no way that Sushant was depressed. They stated that he might've had bad anxiety, but not depression. You know, people were shocked because he came from a small town He wasn't like the superstar, A-list, A-list actor that he wanted to be, but he was like on track. That's where he was headed. I mean, look at his list of accomplishments. Look at how dedicated people were to him, how loyal his viewers were. And he was going to do big things. How could he not be happy and look like he's smiling all the time? This is the only argument that I don't like. I mean, if you bring up other arguments to say, oh, I don't think that he was necessarily depressed because A, B, C, and D, I think that's fine. But this argument, I think, is just rooted in mental health stigma. Like, okay, if you have struggled with depression, I think the hardest part is mustering up all that courage to ask someone for help. And then a few days later, if they see you smiling or trying to be normal, they just assume like, okay, they're better now. All fixed, they're good now. So I don't know, I just don't feel like that's a great one. Um, Some people were arguing the opposite. They were saying Sushant was incredibly creative and intelligent. And according to some statistics, that makes it a lot easier for someone to be depressed. Those are traits that make it easier. That along with the grief of his mother passing, I mean, maybe it was just something that he could not overcome. They used his own quotes about his mom's passing to bolster their side of the theory. He had once said in an interview, but everything that used to excite me doesn't excite me much now. I don't know why. No relationship, no success, absolutely nothing. If my mom were alive, probably it wouldn't concern her, but just something has changed inside of me. Yeah, 
It takes a lot out of me to force myself to get overly excited about things and that's probably the reason that I like acting so much because it helps me get away from myself. I am sure my mom would have been really happy and proud of me and maybe I would have been a different person than I am now if she were still here. She said this where? In an interview long before his death. A filmmaker came out to say that he worked with Sushant and he felt that his mental state was not stable. He stated that he reminded him of Parveen Babi, an actress who was schizophrenic, and he stated that he believed that Sushant was headed in the same way. That is the way he phrased things. He continued, I saw this coming. The filmmaker got a lot of backlash because, well, first of all, the statement is a little insensitive. Just the way that it was phrased was kind of like, all right. And also people were arguing, but if you knew and you did nothing, why didn't you do something if you knew? So there are two big groups that believe in this theory and they can be broken down to simplify, to really simplify, into two subgroups. The first being that Sushant was struggling not only with depression, but also potentially bipolar disorder. And their reasonings include people that are arguing that Sushant was struggling with depression, potentially bipolar disorder, and with the loss of his mom, just a lot of hardship in his life, he couldn't continue anymore. And he physically made the choice to end things. Then you have another group of people saying, Yes, but the main factor he chose to end things, the main reasoning, is not because of the passing of his mom. It's because of what Bollywood did to him. The way that they pushed him out, the negative reviews, the weird Me Too allegation incident, the just stealing roles from him, blocking him from movies. All of these things potentially coupled with a relationship that some people, again, this is all debate. We don't even know for sure if Rhea and Sushant's relationship was toxic because a lot of them are allegations as of right now. And that coupled with the toxic relationship, that led him. So some people are saying generally like mental health is a problem. And then other people are saying, yes, mental health is a problem. But these two things just pushed him over the edge. And again, there's actually a lot more theories than this, but these are the ones that we are covering. And there are also a group of people that are very upset with the theorist. They think that the viewers of Sushant were all soap opera watchers and they callously wanted their own real life soap opera. And after a man passed, they turned it into a real life horror show is what some of them have stated. So one side of the argument, you have people saying that has nothing to do with this. Someone passed away suspiciously. Of course, their death should be investigated, especially when the family demands it. And the other side saying anything is suspicious if you really want it to be. Okay, now there are a bunch of unverified allegations that I'm going to quickly go through. In some sources, it said that one of Sushant's roommates have helped bring him down from where he was suspended. And a lot of people didn't believe that. They said that there was no way one single roommate, because that was what was initially reported allegedly, one single roommate brought down Sushant because that roommate in question was around 5'5 five five at best and Sushant was a six foot tall guy, like a buff guy. They also stated that the Cooper Hospital has very few doctors that are available and well-versed in doing post-mortems. Why would they specifically bring, bring him there? He was already pronounced dead at the scene. So it's not like he went into the hospital for medical attention and then pronounced dead. And it was also alleged that there's a video of Sushant out there and I haven't seen the video. I've only seen pictures, but allegedly you can see his like move. Yeah, I don't know, okay? Also, it was alleged the CCTV footage showing anyone coming in and out in and out of the building was conveniently broken the night before. So the fact that no one else was in that apartment unit with Sushant can only be verified by his three roommates and one of them was detained and it's like a whole thing. Some people don't believe the roommates. Also, another thing being that allegedly they only found his left hand fingerprints in the wrap that he used, but he's right handed. And people argue that there's no way he could have done this himself all alone with one hand. I saw other allegations that reported someone tried to end him with a dog collar and there was evidence that a dog collar was attempted to be used and they felt like that was the ultimate sign of disrespect, which also pointed towards this was a murder. There are other claims that the duplicate spare keys to his apartment were missing. And since CCTV wasn't working, it's surmised that we really have no clue who went into his unit that night. There are other claims that he ran into his neighbors on a morning walk the very morning he passed, and they stated that he was in a good mood. There are other reports that said that there were no chairs or tall tables in the room. So the question being, how did he do it himself? Others argued that his ceilings could have been pretty low and he was a six foot tall man. 
There are other allegations that the ligature marks on his neck don't go upwards like you would expect to see in the case of self-inflicted wounds, but rather they go around. And the ligature marks were more consistent with ropes being tied around him. And we've talked about this in the Korean billionaire cult case, right? But again, these are allegations. And another big one, that started developing was that Bollywood, similar to Hollywood, had an underground ring of sea predators. Like, think Jeffrey Epstein. They alleged that Sushant knew about this and that's why they plotted to take him down. Some even furthered this theory by speculating that Sushant's murder was broadcasted on dark web forums. But that's not, you know, anyway. What's crazy is that's not even it, okay? There are people that have bigger theories, So these are like the small, not small theories, but these are like the honed in theories on Sushant's case. It's honing in on Bollywood, on Sushant's personal life and him as a person. But there is a big layer onion conspiracy, which is the government and politicians and media do not care whether or not he was murdered like they claim they do. But they're using this incident to hide things from the public. So this was the perfect way to egg on the public because this is rare. They were saying it's rare for a case to get this many theories publicized on mainstream media. Like that just doesn't happen. Usually mainstream media stays out of it. It's like social media. So some argued that this was the perfect way for mainstream media to plant seeds of suspicion because as long as people were talking about Sushant and as long as they were angry about Sushant's death, they couldn't be angry about all the other things going on. So what could be going on, you ask? A Redditor speculated, and a lot of people agreed with him, that the government didn't want the population to talk about the pandemic and how the country was handling the policies. Side note, another disclaimer, governments of all nations could be doing things like this. It's always alleged that there's new K-pop dating scandals when South Korea has information they don't want the public to know. This has not been proven or disproven. Same with the U.S. It's speculated that there's always a celebrity cancellation or big ticket news while the government is releasing newly unclassified CIA documents. Again, this is neither proven nor disproven, right? So in no way am I saying like, look at what India might be doing because every government might be doing this. These are not my personal theories. But a lot of citizens felt like the government wanted people to push and speculate the death because they didn't want the media to talk about the 2020 Assam floods. So it's in the northeastern area of India, there were floods going on for about three months. The floods affected over 5 million people, claiming the lives of hundreds. Others argued that the media didn't want to talk about India's GDP and how it had fallen in the April to June period. But some people argue that this was the case for a lot of countries due to lockdowns. So, But either way, maybe the media didn't want an open discussion on it. Another one was pointed out by Redditors was the farm bills had been passed. So these new laws were very divisive. On one hand, supporters of the bill believed that this would empower farmers. Others argued that farmers would be thrown out of business. There were a lot of protests against the 2020 Indian Cultural Acts, and it was just agricultural acts, and it was just really intense. So these are just some of the theories I've seen online. And then, of course, there are a big group of people that argued that this was just a case of human psychology. They stated that everyone was home in lockdown. They were angry and frustrated with the fact that their own lives felt out of control, like I'm sure you and I felt during lockdown. And everyone had their own opinions about whether or not the government was making good choices on their behalf. There was a lot of personal like tensions, interpersonal relationships as families were locked in houses together every single day, nonstop, financial tensions for most of the population. And all of that was transferred onto this case. People wanted something to fight for. They wanted something to be invested in something to keep their minds and emotions occupied this is what people are alleging right so some people are saying no we got to think bigger than this case and that's what they're saying so they argued that people are bored fed up and even aimless and they all needed a goal to rally behind so as you can see my brain is like almost exploding researching this case. This is one of those cases where I feel like I could be like exploring every single theory and idea that people have for two years and I don't even know if I would even have an idea then. Yeah. I wouldn't say that the case has died down, but um, I think that people are still just as passionate about this case and the issues that this case brings to light. In December of 2022, something big happened 
This is two and a half years after Sushant's passing. A mortuary worker that was present when Sushant's body was brought in for a postmortem came out with an interview and stated that Sushant had been murdered. In the interview, he stated, when I saw Sushant's body, I told the seniors that I think it is not suicide, but murder. That's why we should work in the same way. But I was told that you do your work and I will do mine. Wait, he came out full yeah name everything yeah and he said my job was to just cut and sew the body which i did that entire post-mortem should have been videographed but the superior said that they wanted to work on the photographs and hand over the body as soon as possible and that's why we did the post-mortem at night alluding to the allegations that the room wasn't even adequately lit he also stated that there were beating marks on sushant's body and some injury marks at two or three places on his neck there have been no further updates or follow-ups on that speculations made, or the allegations really, made by the mortuary worker. Yeah. Wow. And then June 30th of 2023, the CBI shared new updates about the case. They stated that they are waiting for technical evidence to come back from the U.S. They said they were asking Google and Facebook to pull Sushant's deleted chats, emails, and posts. They said they wanted to analyze it to get a better understanding of what has happened. The family of Sushant don't seem happy with this. Not because they don't want those records, but more so their family stated and alluded to the fact that it seems like the CBI is just trying to throw this case into bureaucratic process of hell. Because like the process of working with the US and then private companies, okay, so like Google and Facebook, they're public companies, but they're in the private sector, meaning they're not under direct orders of the government. So it's not even just like India being like, hey, US government, help us out, friend. It just feels like they're going to use this as an excuse to prolong this for years and years and years and years and years. So as of right now, Sushant's family, they still don't have answers and neither do the public. I will say that I have seen some backlash against people who support Sushant and also believe that he was murdered. But there has been some good things to come out of this case, if I can say it like that, like a silver lining. So after Sushant's passing, a lot of supporters gathered together and they tried to contribute to Sushant's memory in the process of getting justice. So in the midst of the COVID crisis, they started a texting hotline number to connect people who needed hospital beds and oxygen. The fans also organized hashtag Sushant K Ka Kitchen, where they gave food packets to those who needed it during the pandemic. They even organized a drive called hashtag SSR for Education, where they donated money to community educators to provide education to female children in underdeveloped areas. They also organized January 2023 as Sushant Month. They went out on the streets to help care for stray cats and dogs. They created pieces of art in honor of him. And even they made a mission to learn Morse code, which was one of Sushant's 50 bucket list items that he wanted to complete before he passed. Sushant's family have set up a fund for students studying astrophysics at UC Berkeley. That news was announced on his 35th birthday. I think that there is a lot to learn from Sushant's life before he passed, um, regardless of which theory that you believe in. I think what made Sushant different and stand out, even in the crowd of stars, because think about it, his peers are celebrities, right? I think it was his very modest background, his humility, and really his intelligence. He just was so curious. He had a never-ending curiosity to learn things about people, learn things beyond his profession. He loved to read. He loved to act. He loved space. He was a small-town boy who made it amongst the stars, and it was literally just hard work, raw talent, and just contagious passion. He once said in an interview, I've always been fascinated by outer space as a kid too. You know, I was interested in the stars, constellations, and galaxies. And I wanted to know what life in space would be like. And a lot of supporters say that he is now a star in the sky that is shining over all of them. And someone to look up to and be inspired by still. So that is the very, very confusing case of Sushant seeing Rajput. What are your thoughts? I'm, I don't even know how to feel about this case. I don't even know how to feel about the presentation of what I've gathered online because this case truly feels like a never-ending black hole of information and allegations. So 
please again, if there is anything that might have been miscommunicated or interpreted differently, let me know in the comments. And whatever your theory is, and whether or not you disagree with people in the comments, let's just all be nice to each other because I think in the end, people just want justice for Sushant and I don't think that someone like him would want us tearing each other apart in the comments. I hope you guys stay safe and I will see you guys on Wednesday for the main episode. Bye.